Good afternoon. Welcome to the National Museum of American History and to our National Youth Summit on the Freedom Rides. Thank you all so much for coming today. Um, we wanted, you know, a lot of people will tell you that the, the heartbeat of the civil rights movement is the music. The songs, the lyrics, the tunes that so many people sang, that so many important people sang, that so many everyday people sang and heard over the years. And so we thought it would be appropriate for us to begin our program today with music. Before we do that, there's one rule that I have for everybody, and that rule is everyone sings. There are no exceptions. I'm very serious. Don't make us send somebody to come out and get you. And if you can't sing, if you can't sing at all, if you can't hold a tune, if you can't carry a note, can't sing, well, then what I want you to do is sing louder. All right? And it's real easy. All you have to do is repeat after me. All right? So we're going to try this. I'm going to sing something. You repeat. And then I'm going to fill in all the rest. And we're going to see how good we can make this sound. Is everybody ready? Yeah. All right. So repeat after me. I'm on my way. I'm on my way. Oh, that was all right, but we have to do a little bit better. You ready? I'm on my way. I'm on my way. Good. To freedom land. To freedom land. I'm on my way. I'm on my way. To freedom land. To freedom land. Good. I'm on my way. To freedom, to freedom land. Now everybody try this part together at the same time. I'm on my way, oh Lord, to freedom land. That's it. Everybody got it? We have to try it again because some people not singing. Matter of fact, it's a lot of people talking and a lot of people laughing, but not a lot singing. All right? And there are a whole lot of people, a whole lot of very important people who I don't think we should disrespect by not singing the song that they sang so many years ago. All right? So how about we try it again? You ready? Repeat after me. I'm on my way. I'm on my way. Better. To freedom land. To freedom land. I'm on my way. I'm on my way. To freedom land. I'm on my way. To freedom land. Together. I'm on my way. Oh, Lord. To freedom land. Let's try another one. I asked my brother. I asked my brother. Come go with me. Come go with me. I asked my brother. Come go with me. I asked my brother. Come go with me. I'm on my way. Oh Lord to freedom land. Yeah. And if he don't go, going anyhow. If he don't go, going anyhow. If he don't go, going anyhow. I'm on my way, oh Lord, to freedom land. Once again, I'm on my way, I'm on my way. To, freedom land. to freedom land. I'm on my way, to freedom land. I'm on my way, to freedom land. I'm on my way, oh Lord, to freedom land. Give yourselves a hand, excellent. Very nice. Very quickly, I'd like to give everybody some information about our National Youth Summit for today. Uh, we are going to be joined by five other locations all over the country who will be watching via the internet and also with thousands of people in their classrooms and at home who are also going to be watching online. If you're interested in seeing what the web feed looks like, you can look at these screens to uh, your left or to your right, which will show you what people are seeing all over the country as we broadcast today. Uh, these gentlemen right here to my right, your left in front, will be moderating our webcast today. Let's give them a hand. All right, and they will be sending questions up here um, to our moderator here for the panelists as they come over from online. Um, also, two questions have been selected from this location. Uh, when that time comes, you will be notified when to go to the microphone and when to give your question to our panelists. Once the webcast is done, once it signs off, we'll still be going and we'll have a time for us to open up with questions to the panelists. You'll be, uh, you'll be advised when that time is and directed to these microphones to the left and to the right. Uh, please form a line behind and we'll try to get through as many questions as we can in the 15 minutes that we're going to have. All right. Thank you all so much again for coming. Um, please sit tight. We're, our program will begin in just a few moments.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to your National Museum of American History. I'm Brent Glass, director of the museum. And I'm very pleased that uh, you are able to be here uh, this afternoon to join us on the National Youth Summit on the 50th anniversary of the Freedom Rides. A good afternoon to our audience here in Washington, D.C., uh, students from uh, schools throughout the, the city, and to those of you connecting to us via the internet, I would like to welcome the students who are taking part in this program from Smithsonian affiliate museums around the country, the Japanese American National Museum in Los Angeles, the Senator John Hyde's History Center in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the Arab American National Museum in Dearborn, Michigan, the National Underground Railroad Freedom Museum in Cincinnati, Ohio, and the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute in Birmingham, Alabama. Thanks all of you, thanks to all of you for taking the time to join us uh, on this important anniversary in civil rights movement history. And let's welcome our, our guests and our schools from all over the country to this, to this wonderful program. Now, at the National Museum of American History, we have a very important piece of history related to the civil rights movement. A section of the Woolworth department store lunch counter from Greensboro, North Carolina. On February 1st, 1960, four African-American college students made a bold and courageous step toward freedom. They sat at the whites-only lunch counter and politely asked to be served. They were refused. They continued to sit there peacefully and quietly, and their simple but powerful act of protest sparked a fire of activism that burned long after the Woolworths lunch counter was desegregated later that year. The anniversary we are marking today reminds us that the activism that burned in many Americans of all ages and races continued long after the uh, lunch counter protest in, in Greensboro. Fifty years ago, more than 400 men and women became Freedom Riders. The first Freedom Ride left Washington, D.C. on May 4, 1961, which was the anniversary of the famous Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court decision. The Freedom Riders were intent on challenging the laws, known then as Jim Crow laws, that enforced racial segregation in interstate travel. Just as our audience today is made up of thousands of students of diverse backgrounds from across the nation, the Freedom Riders were ordinary Americans. Many of them were not much older than you are. They were determined to put their freedom and even their lives on the line to force the United States to live up to its ideals by ending the injustice in the American South. The Riders endured beatings, bombings, harassment, and imprisonment all for doing something that the U.S. Supreme Court had already twice said they had the right to do. Today, you have a unique opportunity to hear from the very people, history makers, who were at the heart of this story. Our guests who are here today helped change history. And if you have ever felt you cannot make a difference, if you felt that the problems in this country or around the world are too big for you to, to challenge or to take on, I think today you will see and, and listen and learn from the people who joined the Freedom Rides and changed our history. And our country is better for their actions. Our guests today are a remarkable group of people. Congressman John Lewis, who is 19 years old and already a veteran of the student civil rights movement. The Reverend James Lawson, who is a, an advocate of nonviolence and a colleague and friend of the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Diane Nash, of Chicago, a student leader who fought segregation across the South, and Jim Zwerg of Wisconsin, a student who joined the Freedom Rides knowing that he would be targeted by other white students as a traitor to their way of life. We also have other Freedom Riders with us in the audience, and I'm delighted to welcome Dion Diamond, the Reverend Reginald Green, Joan Mulholland, and Travis Britt. These people are really the heroes that we recognize and honor, and just join me in, in giving them a, a round of applause. Before we begin our Youth Summit today, I want to acknowledge the generous support of partners and sponsors and donors. 
I want to thank them for their collaboration and assistance. From our partners within the Smithsonian, uh, Claudine Brown, the Assistant Secretary for Education and Public Access, uh, the National Museum of African American History and Culture and its founding director, Lonnie Bunch, and the Smithsonian Affiliations Program, uh, directed by Harold Kloster. Our thanks also go to our partners at the National Endowment for the Humanities, Carol Watson, the Deputy Director, and Tom Phelps, Director of the Division of Public Programs. And to our friends at Booz Allen Hamilton, Joe Suarez, Mark McLean, Christine Hoisington, and Laura Heyman, all are here today uh, joining us. I also would like to um, welcome and thank the people who produced a new compelling film, Freedom Riders, an American Experience WGBH production. Mark Samuels, Executive Producer, Lorreen Prestelio, project manager, and the filmmaker Stanley Nelson. Also contributing his scholarship and knowledge, and who will be our moderator for our panel today, is Professor Raymond Arsenal, who has written the definitive account of this era, era uh, Freedom Rides, 1961, and the struggle for racial justice. I also want to uh, mention, and last but not least, mention the great staff of the National Museum of American History. Thanks to all of you for your teamwork and your dedication to this, this and many other programs. To begin our National Youth Summit, we would like to take you now to the opening scene of Stanley Nelson's film, Freedom Riders, where you will hear in their own voices the people who participated in the Freedom Rides and learn what motivated them to do something very extraordinary, to fill out their applications, to risk everything, to become a freedom rider. Thank you. I wish to apply for acceptance as a participant in CORE's Freedom Ride, 1961. To travel via bus from Washington, D.C. to New Orleans, Louisiana, and to test and challenge segregated facilities en route. I understand that I should be participating in a nonviolent protest against racial discrimination, that arrest or personal injury to me might result the Freedom Rides of 1961 were a simple but daring plan. The Congress of Racial Equality came up with the idea to put blacks and whites in small groups on commercial buses, and they would deliberately violate the segregation laws of the Deep South. We were to go through various parts of the South, gradually going deeper and deeper, six of us on the Trailways bus and six of us on the Greyhound bus and see whether places were segregated, whether people were being served when they went to get something to eat or buy a ticket or use the restrooms. One of the major thrusts of the Freedom Ride was to get the movement into the Deep South. Most, most of the action up to, up to this time had been in the Upper South or in the North. And one of the ideas here was to go into the deepest South we were hoping that this would start a national movement. CORE had this set itinerary. They anticipated that this would be a two-week trip, that it would culminate down in New Orleans with a real celebration on the anniversary of the Brown versus Board of Education decision. And there's almost an element of naivete attached to it, how easily they thought it would go. I'm a senior at American Baptist Theological Seminary and hope to graduate in June. I know that an education is important, and I hope to get one. But at this time, human dignity is the most important thing in my life, that justice and freedom might come to the deep south.
my name is uh, Ray Arsenault, and I'd like to welcome the audience, uh, both the students and teachers here at the National Museum of American History, uh, those at the five regional sites, and the, I think, countless thousands who are watching us via webcast. Uh, let me begin by thanking the Smithsonian Institution for the rather remarkable technology that made this National Youth Summit possible today. Uh, I can't help but think what the freedom struggle, what the Civil Rights Movement might have been like if we'd had this technology back in 1961. Um, maybe we'd be even closer to the beloved community than we are uh, today. Uh, we are here to commemorate and more than that, to draw inspiration from the Freedom Rides of 1961, one of the most extraordinary events in American history. And it's our particular good fortune to have uh, such a distinguished panel of guests, participants, individuals who played a key role in the Freedom Rides a half century ago. Uh, they're here, of course, to, to share their wisdom, but I think also to learn from you, uh, to engage in a dialogue, to talk about ideas that were powerful in 1961, and we'd like to think potentially even more powerful today. So let me briefly uh, introduce our panel. Uh, on my immediate right is Jim Zwerg, former Freedom Rider. On his right, the Reverend James Lawson. And to his right, Diane Nash. And to her right, uh, who just arrived, we're so glad he's here, Stanley Nelson, the director of Freedom Riders. And just in from the House floor, Representative John Lewis. We have a couple of minutes before we turn to questions from the regional sites, and I thought it would be most appropriate uh, to talk about the period, uh, about events just before the Freedom Rides, and to ask our panelists, and maybe begin with Representative Lewis, uh, if he can recall uh, how he first became engaged with the struggle for social justice and civil rights, uh, how he became involved before the Freedom Rides. Representative Lewis? Well, thank you very much. I must say that I'm delighted and very pleased to be here with uh, my friends and, and my colleagues. And these colleagues of mine are responsible for getting me involved, getting me involved in what I call trouble, good <laughs> trouble, necessary trouble. Mm. Now, I grew up in rural Alabama, and when I was growing up there, I saw those signs that said white men, colored men, white women, colored women, white waiting, colored waiting. I saw segregation. I tasted the bitter fruits of racism, and I didn't like it. At the age of 15 in the 10th grade, in 1955, I heard of Rosa Parks, heard the words of Martin Luther King Jr. on an old radio. I was so inspired by Dr. King and Rosa Parks that in 1956, at the age of 16, with some of my brothers and sisters and first cousins, we went down to the public library in the little town of Troy, trying to get some books and library cards. And we were told that the library was for whites only and not for colored. I never went back to the Pack County Public Library until July 5th, 1998, for a book signing of my book. And at the end of the program, they gave me a library card. <laughs> but in 1957, I met Rosa Parks. In 1958, at the age of 18, I met Martin Luther King Jr. I was in school in Nashville. And one evening, I was attending a meeting at a church, and I heard Jim Lawson, this young man, speaking that he was going to conduct some nonviolent workshop. And I went and attended one of those nonviolent workshops, and I got hooked. 
and I've been hooked ever since <laughs> on trying to do what I can to bring about justice and freedom for all humankind. And I met Diane Nash at the workshops. And like so many of us, we fell in love with her. <laughs> with her leadership, with her beauty. And um, later I met Jim Spurry, who was an exchange student at Fish University. And we started sitting in. We had what we call test sit-ins in November and December 1959. Mm. And on a regular basis, we started sitting in in February 1960. And the first time I got arrested, I make it short. My folks had told me, don't get in trouble. Don't get in the way. I got arrested, and I felt free. I felt liberated. I felt like I crossed over, and I've been over ever since. Uh, Diane, would you like to maybe answer the same question? You get to speak five times because there are five of us, so you get to speak after each one of us. <laughs> wow. To equalize it. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I was a student at Fisk University in the fall of 1959. I grew up on the south side of Chicago, which was segregated, but the difference was they didn't have signs mm. that said white only and, and colored. So when I went to Nashville to Fisk that fall, it was the first time I had experienced emotionally actually seeing signs that said that I couldn't go through this door or eat at this restaurant and so forth. And I found it uh, humiliating and I felt outraged. Every time I obeyed, a segregation sign. I felt like I was agreeing that I was too inferior to behave as, as the public did. So I started, and, and also if you went to downtown Nashville during the lunch hour, the blacks who worked downtown would be sitting along the curb, often near the alley, eating their lunch food that they had either brought from home or bought at a restaurant because you could buy food on a carryout basis, but you couldn't sit down and eat it. And so I found that humiliating also. I started looking for an organization that was trying to do something to combat segregation. And one of my fellow students told me about Reverend Jim Lawson's workshops that were meeting once a week near the Fisk campus. And I began going to those workshops and I think I'm a very lucky woman. I was at the right place at the right time and got a very excellent education in nonviolence. Well, we had had a successful movement that desegregated lunch counters in 1960. I had left school to work full time for the movement in Nashville. And I was preparing, uh, Celine McCollum and I, another student that was in the movement, we were preparing a newsletter. And people would send us notices of things that they wanted us to put in the newsletter. I got a notice that CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, was going to begin a freedom ride. The purpose was to desegregate interstate bus travel. So that's Greyhound and Trailway buses. And that they were going to begin in Washington, D.C., travel south, and then travel west through Alabama, Mississippi, and end in Louisiana. And that they were going to be defying the segregation rules by having blacks sit in the front instead of the back and whites sit in the back instead of the front or having blacks and whites sit together on the bus. And the same thing with the waiting rooms. And when I looked at their itinerary, I felt like they might need help 
before they finish. Um, we also, um, John Lewis was from the Nashville movement, and he was one of the original freedom writers that was going to begin in Washington, D.C. Well, we agreed very much with their, with CORE's uh, purpose to desegregate interstate bus travel. And I remember writing a little blurb in the newsletter announcing the Freedom Ride and saying that since um, we ag agree with what they were doing, we in Nashville would stand by in case at some point they would need our help. Well, thank you, Diane. I think we're ready for our first question from one of the regional <clears throat> sites. Great, thank you, Ray. We're gonna go ahead first to the Japanese American National Museum in Los Angeles and see if we have someone standing by for a question for our panel here. Do we have the question? Or? The question should be coming in just a second. Let's listen in for it right now. Well, we're not getting off the bus, so we're, we're, wait, we're waiting here for you. Erwin <laughs> Espinosa. Um, my name is Erwin Espinosa, and I'm here with the Civitas School of Leadership Group. And my, my question is, what was the defining moment that influenced your decision about joining the Freedom Race? Um. Let me repeat the question if I can, and I think maybe uh, Cong Congressman Lewis might be the most appropriate to start. Uh, he's asking, when was the moment that you uh, sort of knew you had to become a Freedom Rider, a sort of moment of engagement? As Diane suggested, CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, was the chief sponsor of the Freedom Ride, and they sent out an application. And when I saw the application to apply to go on the Freedom Ride, I knew then that I had to go. For four years, I traveled by Greyhound bus from Troy, Alabama, through Montgomery, through Birmingham, to Nashville to school. And I didn't like it. I didn't like segregation, as I said before and I wanted to do something about it. Now in Nashville, we had been successful. We had deseg desegregated the lunch counters, the restaurants, the theaters, the theaters. and I mm -hmm. thought it was important for me to, to go. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't tell my mother, my father, any of my sisters or brothers. I came to Washington, D.C. on May 1st, 1961, for a period of trans uh, orientation, and I remember so well, so well, the night of May 3rd, we went downtown Washington, D.C. to a little restaurant. It was a Chinese restaurant. I never had Chinese food before. And it was a wonderful meal. It was a wonderful meal. Someone said, eat well. This may be like the Lord's last. Supper or the Last Supper. <laughs> so on the next day, May 4th, the 13 of us left Washington, D.C., to travel through the South. And I knew I had to be on a freedom ride. Reverend Lawson? Yeah, uh, let me say something about this. Uh, first of all, that, um, that the freedom ride was an emerging campaign that had already seen a series of campaigns in the struggle. We were a part of an emerging movement. Um, 1955, we saw the Montgomery bus boycott. Then there were boycotts in Orangeburg, South Carolina by students. The Little Rock Nine were in Little Rock, Arkansas, going to Central High School. That was, a, that was an extraordinary struggle. I got to meet all of those nine people in 1958 and gave them workshops on nonviolence. So we, it was a developing movement. 1955 was the bus boycott of Montgomery, Alabama, but 55 was also a Tallahassee bus boycott. Baton Rouge was 1953. So you begin to get the intensification of struggle 
that was waking up a great number of especially black people about the necessity of engaging direct action. Dr. King and the Montgomery bus boycott very clearly articulated that they wanted to do this boycott out of what King called on the very first day Christian love. Then eventually that term became nonviolence. So for the first time in a major fashion, I want to say in Western civilization, as well as in the United States, of 50,000 people were engaged in a walking instead of riding the buses, and they were calling it nonviolence. The first major use of the term in a political struggle in Western civilization up to that time. Uh, out of Montgomery, and King, of course, was the person who eventually came around to seeing it as what Gandhi called nonviolence around 1906. When John brought me his application for the core uh, Freedom Ride, uh, I not only endorsed him strongly on going, but I wrote him a major letter of reference to be a part of that freedom run. I knew Jim, I knew Jim Farmer. Congress of Racial Equality had been organized around 1942 to try to use nonviolence in places like Chicago, Los Angeles, Cleveland, and elsewhere. So this freedom right is one campaign uh, that was that helped to emerge to further strengthen the awakening of the country, the awakening of the black community of the necessity of direct action against Jim Crow law, against segregation, and against racism and all of its concomitant features and dimensions. So it's important for us to understand that. It's also important to understand that this is a national issue and not a regional issue. I was age four when my father became the pastor of St. James AME Zion Church in Massillon, Ohio. At age four, on the streets of Massillon, Ohio, I first met my first racial slurs, jungle bunny and other such slurs in the parks. And at age four, I recognized that this was something I was not going to take, that I had to resist it. And that's how I got started. Wow. I think we're ready for the next question, but I have to say, Hearing you talk about writing a recommendation for Representative Lewis, I, I've written a lot of recommendations in my life, but never one with such consequences. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Quite extraordinary. That's right. uh, uh, yeah. uh, next question. The next question, the, the next question is going to come uh, to us uh, from the Heinz History Center in uh, Pittsburgh, and we're going to turn now to Pittsburgh and listen in. Pittsburgh Public Schools. Um, as a white freedom rider in the deep south who came from Wisconsin, what was it like for you to try to convince other white people to act and take a stand against violence and white supremacy through nonviolent protest? I think this one's for you, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's asking about what it was like as a white person from Wisconsin um, you know, to get involved in the freedom rides. That what, maybe you can sort of recapture some of the, the, you know, the depth of meaning of the, of the experience. Very briefly, I grew up in an all-white community. Uh, all the way through high school, I had no one of any other race in any of my classes. Uh, my parents raised me to understand tolerance, right from wrong, etc. but nothing was really tied, you know, no overt situations of race. Uh, I got to college, and I had, uh, my freshman year, uh, a Negro roommate. And the very first night, my folks invited him and my other roommate out to dinner. And we went to a very nice country club and sat down and ordered and waited and waited. And finally, the maitre d' came up and whispered in my dad's ear and Dad just turned to us and said, we're leaving now. 
And we all got up and found another place to eat because they refused to serve Bob. That was my first experience, and in living with him there at college, it wasn't, of course, as, vert, as overt as in the South, but uh, we'd go to the cafeteria and people get up and leave the table, and in my naiveness, I pledged a fraternity, and I was excited to invite him over to the fraternity, and I was informed he wasn't welcome because the fraternity I had joined was segregated. So I said, well, I guess I don't want to be a Sigma Chi, and gave them back their pen. Uh, I had a short temper. I, I really, it used to bother me that uh, Bob would, you know, they, people would say things loud enough for him to hear, or if we were in intramural sports, they'd do a dirty foul, and he never, never returned kind. And I finally said, Bob, you know, for crying out loud, why do you take this crap? Why, you know, I, I can't see how you can do this. And he went over to his dresser and pulled out the paperback, which was Dr. King's Stride Towards Freedom, mm -hmm. which, of course, lays out the principles of nonviolence and the steps to social change and tells the story of the boycott. And he said, read this and let's talk about it afterwards. No. He never had attended a workshop. You know, he was a very, very bright young man. But after I read it and we sat down and talked, he said, you know, Jim, if I return in kind, all it's going to do is escalate the problem. I choose not to live that kind of life. Mm -hmm. And it got me thinking, well, I wonder how I would react if I was in the minority. And it happened that our college had an exchange program with Fisk. And I applied for that, and it got me down to Fisk. And the very first day I was there, I went over to the student union, and uh, they had a little place where you could get a burger and shake and stuff. And I ordered mine, and I barely turned around, and a young couple came over and invited me to, to join them, which I did. And, and we got along very well. I mean... Anybody hear of the twist? <laughs> well, they were out there dancing, you know. And I said, what is that? And they said, the twist. And I said, I know how to twist. And I got up there. <laughs> oh, baby. <I'm> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you, I got a bad back and a bad knee, and I can't dance the way they dance. <laughs> but I went, we just, we had a super time, and... You know, time was going by, and I said, you know, we still got time. Why don't we go take in a movie this afternoon? And they looked at me and said, Jim, we can't go to a movie together. The movie theaters are segregated. My immediate reaction was, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> you know, I, I just I had a real hard time believing that. But again, I'm coming here totally ignorant of really what the situation is in the South. And they said, well, but we're starting a campaign to integrate the movie theaters. And it's going to start tomorrow. There's going to be a meeting tonight. Why don't you come join us? And I said, okay. And so we met at, at the home of one of the professors, Dr. and Mrs. Fuson, a Quaker couple that he served as kind of the student faculty a liaison to the kids that got involved. And I was informed there was going to be this demonstration the next day. So I went down and I watched for a while and the kids just stood there. They weren't singing freedom songs. They weren't carrying placards, nicely dressed, but they just stood there. And I watched for a well, half hour or so and I went across the street and I went to the person at the end of the line and explained, you know, I'd watched, what are you trying to accomplish? And the person said, well, you need to speak to our spokesman, that young fellow up there. Well, that young fellow up there is that young man at the other end of the line, John Lewis. And he said, you know, the demonstration's about to get over. We're going to go back to the church. If you'd like to follow us back there, I'll be happy to talk with you. And so I did. And I don't know how to put it simply, but... John knocked my socks off. 
I, I mean, John is a little younger than me. And here was a fellow. He was attending seminary. The, the depth of his faith was so obvious. The strength of his commitment to nonviolence. Just the love that he expressed, the strength. I always kind of called him the rock of the Nashville movement because he was one of those guys, come what may, he'd be there for you. And he was on that Montgomery platform. The pictures are of John Lewis and myself. He was there, and I knew he'd be there. And he mentioned that the next day there was going to be a workshop with this gentleman. And I went, I didn't actively get involved in it at that point. I, I was still too much of a, a rabble rouser with a short temper. But one of the things Jim kept stressing was that nonviolence has to be a way of life. If you only consider it a technique, sooner or later, you're going to break. And he'd present statements of Gandhi or examples from Gandhi or Dr. King and especially from the Bible. It's not a secret that our adult leadership were ordained ministers. Dr. King alludes and is quoted frequently scriptural passages. And over the time, I wrestled with those scriptural passages of turning the other cheek and loving your enemy and praying for those that persecute you. And finally, it just hit me like a ton of bricks that the greatest story ever told is the greatest story of nonviolent direct action ever told. Innocent suffering, love, unbounding love, forgiveness. And I realized I want that. And I embraced nonviolence in my way of life. And I then became very active in the, in the workshops and ultimately in the stand-ins in Nashville and was honored to be elected to the Central Committee. And I was on the Central Committee when we made the decision to continue the ride. And I volunteered and was uh, one of those chosen to continue the ride. Well, thank you, Jim, for... <laughs> Especially for giving the forum a new twist. But we're, we're going to have to dance off to the next question. <laughs> Here. That's right. We'll see if this one requires a dance response. Uh, this question comes from the Arab uh, American National Museum, and it's coming Hello, to us my from... my name is Alicia Savage Frenchman. Coming to us from I'm Dearborn, from Michigan. Green Hills in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And my question is, why the model of nonviolence practiced by Gandhi was so attractive to the civil rights leaders? Why was it so important? It's seen as so important. Uh, Jonathan, could you repeat the question? I don't think we could hear it very well. We're going to uh, ask our, our friend in Dearborn if she could go ahead and just repeat the question for us. Thank you. Why the model of nonviolence practiced by Gandhi was so attractive to civil rights leaders? Why was it seen as so important and essential? Why? Uh, this is a question for, for Reverend Lawson. Why nonviolence? Yeah. Uh, did you get the gist of the question, Jonathan? Why was the, uh, this idea of nonviolent uh, yes. protest mm -hmm. of sure. appealing for, for, uh, for Reverend Lawson? Okay. <clears throat> this is a difficult question because we in the United States are very much acculturated to the notion that the only way you make effective change is through violence. We even have now people who proclaim that the only way your child learns is by punishment, uh, not discipline. So it's a hard question. Uh, how do you explain this? Well, I explain it in two or three ways, if I can do this very, very quickly. In the first instance, Many slaves in the 250-year period in which my great 
grandparents and my great great grandparents, my great 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 grandparents were slaves. A great number of slaves uh, tried to protect their lives by not becoming slave like and slavery oriented. And for those of you who are interested in that, there are books out on the Negro spiritual, which go back three, four hundred years. Uh, the most original music composed on the American shores uh, up to that time. And you'll find not a word of hatred in those songs. You will find no words of getting, getting back at anybody. <laughs> you find aspiration, you find Freedom. themes of hope, themes of slavery ending. Uh, especially using the model of uh, the book of Exodus and uh, slavery being ended in the book of Exodus and the Moses model. So that's number one. So there was a form of Christianity that grew among slaves and into the black church that said you cannot overcome evil with evil. If you imitate the evil, you escalate and multiply the evil, you get nothing done. We're all human beings, we all have to learn to live together, and the best way for that to happen is then to not let the wrong get on the inside of your life, reject it, and do everything possible to be a person of love and truth and wonder. So that's, that's the first issue. Now that is not Pacifism, which was a strong movement at different ways in the United States through the Christian churches. Pacifism is not nonviolence. Uh, pacifism is primarily a religious notion that war is always wrong. And though I may agree with that in large measure, nonviolence is a term that was invented by Gandhi, created by Gandhi in about 1906 in South Africa, as he tried to understand how he could organize Indians in South Africa to resist the rather tyrannical white government's um, laws against them and do it without imitating the white government's racism. So, out of that, he coined the term <clears throat> nonviolence. Uh, nonviolence fundamentally means that we human beings are, have power. We have the power of life. For you, for you young people, I'd like to use this example. How many of you can remember when you were one day old or 10 days old, or six weeks old, or six months old. If you could ask your mother or father about those ages, they would tell you probably that you were always squirming, <laughs> wiggling your toes, wiggling your hands. Your pants. You were opening their eyes and blinking them all the time. Well, the baby is not born helpless, the baby is born with the power of life. And one way that I describe nonviolence is this, that that power of life that you've been given, the ability to achieve life, to achieve purposes, like controlling your fingers, that's nonviolent power. And the difficulty is in our society that we are taught to desert that power of life and love and then to use the fist or the gun and anger to get our points across or to survive. In fact, the human race has survived for maybe a million years primarily through creativity and flexibility and adaptability and by the development of the brain and not by the development of the club. Yeah. 
Uh, so, so nonviolence, from my perspective, uh, is a 20th century term and concept uh, out of out of Gandhi. It's like it's like the term heterosexual. That's a 20th century term. The human race had no such notion prior to maybe the latter part of the 19th century. Nonviolence is a 20th century term. It means use your creative gifts, love, truth, beauty, your capacities of language, your capacities of courage to deal with your conflicts and to deal with calamity. Don't use fear. Don't use hatred. Because those only create more complexity and difficulty. Thank you, Reverend Lawson. Uh, I think when we hear such eloquence and wisdom, we begin to understand why things happened the way they did in Nashville in 1960 and 1961 and, and beyond. I think we're ready for the next question, uh, which I think is for Diane Nash from the National Underground Railroad uh, Freedom Center. That's right. Let's go ahead and turn to them now. from Holmes High School in Covington, Kentucky. And our question is, it is clear to me from the film that you have had a strong sense of the power of democracy. Even though it had not worked for you in the society, why did you take the individual responsibility to help lead the freedom rides? And how do you suggest individuals to take responsibility to improve democracy today? Diane? Would you repeat that question? Uh, the question has to do with the responsibility of the individual to do something to improve or perfect democracy today, the kind of the legacy of the Freedom Rides, what does that help us to understand the role of the individual in a democracy? Um, I was at the beginning of my adult life at that time. And I was very conscious of the fact that I would be bringing children into the world and I wanted my children and other children to be born into and come of age in the best uh, world, the best society I could help bring about. I think one of the real problems uh, today is that I hear people who seem to feel that if they vote, they are being a responsible citizen. And that is so wrong. That 10 minutes that people spend in the voting booth every two years is not enough. I think back sometimes um, and, and wonder if we in the civil rights movement had left it to elected officials to desegregate restaurants and lunch counters and to desegregate buses. I wonder how long we would have had to wait. And I think truly that we might still be waiting. <laughs> but the fact that the students took it upon themselves without anybody's permission, really. Uh, as John said a few minutes ago, he didn't tell his parents and his family what he was about to do. And I think many or most of us did not tell our families and certainly did not get permission from anybody. I think it was the spirit that led us. Um, and that's who we got permission from. Um, one of the things that I think is very troubling to me today is that knowing that in a democracy, the citizens are rulers of the country. And today, I do not think that most Americans feel like we are rulers of this country. 
and therefore we don't act like it. And we should begin doing that. If you are not going to take responsibility, and I mean you as an individual, the person you see when you look in the mirror, then who is? Um, there is no superhuman or no somebody else who has any more responsibility to do what needs to be done in society than you. Um, like I said, if not you, who would it be? There's one other thing that is very valuable to me, something I discovered by being in the movement that I didn't know before. And that is that there is a source of power within each of us that we never discover until you take on the responsibility of making changes in the society that need to be made. I didn't know it was there in myself, and I know I never would have discovered it if I had not been in the movement. So I have had the opportunity to make changes that people assured me I'd never be able to do. When I opposed the war in Vietnam, and I told some people that I was planning to take part in some organizations that were um, against the war. A number of people told me, <laughs> are you serious? You're talking about the United States Marines and coming up against the United States government and what have you. And I knew that if we tried, we would have some good results. And I told somebody the other day who was feeling really helpless about making some changes, I told them truthfully, I have never tried to make some changes in society that I haven't been successful at doing. And I don't mean just me personally, because one person is limited in what they can do, but you can be a catalyst in organizing other people and many people. So I have never been part of a serious attempt at making change for the right reason and with truth and love that has not been successful. Thank you, Diane. <clears throat> I believe we have a question from the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. Given the legacy of the freedom rights, we now understand the importance of taking a stand for civil and human rights. However, when we observe events like the protests in Egypt, it is apparent that the nature of activism has evolved. What do you think is the cause for this transformation and what methods of activism do you foresee in the future? Um. Very interesting question about the evolution of activism. I wonder, Stanley, if you might want to start us off at least, and maybe others may want to join in, but I, I know in conversations with you, you've often talked about your filmmaking uh, as a way of making moral statements, of making a difference in the world. And I, I sort of see that, that, this wonderful film that you've made as part of the legacy of the Freedom Rides, a continuation of the rides. And I wonder if you might talk about how you see your own contributions or your sense of things in terms of this question about the evolution of activism. Sure. Ray, would you just repeat her question, please? Her question has to do uh, with uh, looking at what's happening in the streets of Cairo right now. We're all sort of fixed, I think, a bit on the potential there and what's happening, what's not happening. And it's, it's uh, I think, quite understandable to try to connect it to historical events and to such things as the Freedom Rides. Uh, to, this, to the freedom struggle, to movements for social justice, and it suggests that maybe there's a kind of evolution, that maybe what we're seeing may be something new, maybe something old, and I wonder yeah. 
Uh, if Stanley might start us off and maybe others can jump in. Yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely a connection to what's happening in, in Egypt and to the Freedom Rides. I mean, it, it, it's definitely made me think about it. I, we, we are much more connected, obviously, um, than we were back then. You know, um, we have internet, uh, blogs, so many different ways of being connected, and, and information travels so much faster. One of the things that, that was surprising when we were making the film was that um, for the first almost two weeks of the Freedom Rides, there was no news coming out, you know? Not until um, the bus was bombed did suddenly there, there was an interest in the Freedom Rides and suddenly the media covered it. Um, the black press was there, but they were weekly presses, so there, there, there just wasn't that much coverage of it. You know, now we're seeing what's happening in Egypt almost the moment it's happening. But I think still, it, it's still the same thing. It's still, you know, people rising up and taking a stand and, and wanting to make change. And, and it happened so fast. You know, I, I was thinking, of, as people here were talking, I was thinking about how the Freedom Riders affected my life, you know, that... Uh, you know, I'm, I'm just a little bit younger than they are. I was about 10 years old when it happened. But in that 10 years, the, my, you know, the whole world changed. I mean, I wouldn't be sitting here as an African-American filmmaker if it wasn't for the, the steps that, that these people here took. So, you know, change happens really quickly. And as Diane was saying about, about the, the war, the Vietnam War, it happened quickly, you know, people, at first it was like, you'll never change this, this war will never stop, and then it did. You know, we're seeing in Egypt, one day, Egypt is one thing, the next day it's another. So I think, you know, at, at, when people want to make change, when people make a stand, um, things can happen very, very quickly. Thank you. Other thoughts? That? Yes. When you travel around the world, it could be in Africa, Asia, Europe, Central South America, people know the story of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. There's one report coming out that more than 250,000 copies of the Montgomery story, the FOR, the mm -hmm. Fellowship of Reconciliation, did it in coming strip. Mm -hmm. They were distributed in Egypt, primary in Cairo, in 08, 09, and some last year. When you go to Germany, go to South Africa, any place, the people talk about the civil rights movement. We read the literature, we watch the films, we know all about Dr. King. So we live in, in one world, the world is small. We didn't have a website. <laughs> we, we never heard the internet. No email. We didn't have an email. <laughs> and I don't know if we had all these things, but we would have been able to do. So you're so right. People come to that point where they are tired, they're fed up, and they're saying we, can't, we cannot and will not take it anymore. <coughs> I watched the drama in the street of Cairo. For me, it is very inspiring. Mm -hmm. And I think it was spread to the other parts of the Middle East, and to Africa, and other places where people have been held down. We, we have more activism. Uh, more concern for the quality of life for the human race than uh, I've ever known to, uh, to, to exist in my, my own years of life, my eight decades now of life. Uh, more activism in the sense of recognizing, recognizing more of the dots that have to be connected among us human beings, among various peoples, religions and races and whatnot and whatnot. The, the, there are two missing quotas, two, two missing equations maybe. The first one is that the recognition of nonviolence as personal power and social political power is missing. Most of the books I've read about the civil rights movement thus far do not give any serious treatment to nonviolence. <laughs> Spirituality. Yeah. There's some exceptions, I hope. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I haven't gotten that section of your book yet. Really. Oh. Maybe, yeah, I, and, and, and I'll, look, I'll be more careful to be looking for it as I continue. I've not finished it yet, but I've, I'm reading it. Uh, and it is a, signif a very significant piece of work. Um, 
but by and large, the, the civil rights movement, the phrase civil rights has glossed over personal power, personal responsibility to link up with other people uh, and, to, and to make change. The second equation that I want to put on the table here is that the Freedom Ride is a good example of it. We had to literally force the Democratic administration at that time to see what we were doing as a serious dysfunctionality of American society. That governments should take a, a part, a role in playing. They did not want to do it, did not, not want to see that as a function of government. Ross Barnett of Mississippi and John Patterson of Alabama said that government <laughs> can allow hostility <laughs> to be a dominant element of the society, can allow segregation to be constitutional by their state governments. We today have, I think in large measure, federal government that really does not support the human rights of all human beings everywhere in the world. The issue in Cairo is in part also our policies of 60 years towards the Middle East, our economic policies, our political policies. So the big question is, can structures for freedom, justice, liberty for all, equality for all in Cairo emerge out of those streets, out of that movement? Are there, will there be sufficient numbers of people of all stripes in Egypt who will see it to their advantage to allow this to mean we will strengthen our families, we will improve our neighborhoods, we will increase government as a responsible vehicle for the well-being of the people of Egypt. That's the big issue. Mm -hmm. Are there forces in the world, governmental forces in the world, who will support the people in developing that kind of a process in Egypt, it would be the first time it's ever happened uh, in the Middle East mm -hmm. or in Egypt. So that, those two issues, it seems to me, are important Thank you. issues. Thank you. Uh, I urge you who are young people to do some real exploring of nonviolence as an option to war, to violence, to hatred, to responding to wrong with another wrong to pursuing a life's course that is rooted in the very best that you are, namely the fact that you are a gift of creation, a gift of God, a gift of life. There's nothing comparable to it. And your use of it can make all the difference mm -hmm. to who you are and what you are, and then to how you will respond politically and socially in the world. Thank you. Well, speaking of the students, uh, I think we've come to the moment finally, you've been very patient, where some, well, at least one of the students, maybe two of the students mm -hmm. in our audience here at the National Museum of American History can ask a question. You got it. And we, we have a number of students online, individuals, not at our sites, and of course many here in the room, so we're going to have opportunities for both. We're going to take one more web question, and then we're going to turn to our face-to-face -face audience as well here in D.C. This is a question from Patrick. Uh, in. question from uh, Patrick in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, who wants to know if there have been any efforts or opportunities for reconciliation between any of the Freedom Riders uh, who were beaten and some of the folks who may have been doing the beating. And if you don't mind repeating the question, whoever answers it for our web audience, that would be great. Opportunities for reconciliation. Uh, I'm not sure if you heard the question, but about have there been opportunities for reconciliation between those who were on the segregationist side, may have been in the crowds of the riots that attack the Freedom Riders and, and the Freedom Riders and people in the, in the 
civil rights movement. Representative Lewis. Well, on May 9, 1961, in Rock Hill, South Carolina, this is the original ride. Uh, my seatmate was a white gentleman. The two of us tried to enter a so-called white waiting room. And the moment we entered the room, a group of young white men attacked us, beat us, and left us lying in a pool of blood. Two years ago, one of the men, a few years older than I am, came to Washington, and he said, Mr. Lewis, I attack you. I beat you on May 9, 1961. Will you accept my apology and forgive me? This gentleman started crying. He gave me a hug. I hugged him back and shed some tears. Since then, I've seen him and his son on several occasions. <clears throat> I think that's what the Freedom Ride and the Civil Rights Movement was all about. Yeah. To move us to that point where we can build a sense of community, where we can build a sense of family. Mm. The man said he felt free. I felt free. And there's something very pure about it. Uh, was the first person that attacked me that came and said, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Mm -hmm. You know, I just wanted to say that there were so many meetings that John Lewis attended with bandages on his head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I, I have been so impressed with his determination because the only way you could stop him would have been to completely kill him <laughs> because he would get beaten and come bloodied and bandaged to meetings and go on demonstrations. Um, and, and he was determined to end segregation. Jim Zwerg I visited in the hospital in Montgomery after he was beaten. And uh, I, I remember, Jim, you wore contact lenses yes. at that time. And there was a red circle in the white of his eye where his contact lens had slipped to the side and he had been beaten and uh, just, just beaten extremely badly. I think one of the things, when, when I've gone out and spoken, uh, I'm surprised quite often, especially with young people, everybody seems to know the I have a dream speech. But I'll frequently ask, how many of you have ever read Dr. King's Stride Towards Freedom? Would you raise your hand? Dr. King's Stride Towards Freedom, the story of, of the Montgomery bus boycott, where he lays out the principles of nonviolence and the steps for social change. Mm -hmm. It's usually one, sometimes two. Yeah. And I think it's so important one of the things that Jim would do during our workshops is stress the various <coughs> principles. One of those principles that lends itself to reconciliation is the reality that what we were doing was based in that love so that when someone was hitting you, you didn't, you didn't, you hated their hatred but you didn't hate the person hating. And because you forgave them and you loved them, in that instant you were giving them an opportunity to change. And sometimes it happened. Sometimes people would come and say, gee, I'm sorry I hit you. And when they do change, that love in your heart then opens that door to the relationship of reconciliation. And it's always, always got to be a part of the movement. Sure. When there was so much more, it was great when we got the movie theaters to let us in. But then you want to go back and build the relationship with the powers at the movie theater, with the people that work in the movie theater. Because you didn't want to stop just going to the movies. 
I wanted her to get a job there because she deserved it. There was so much more to do than just eat a hamburger or go to a movie theater. Our hope, our goal, our dream, our vision was the beloved community. And it starts within you and it spreads to those around you. The bond that we had, we called ourselves brothers and sisters and we called ourselves that because we are indeed brothers and sisters. And we will be to the day we die. Thank you, Jim. We are. We're coming. There is at least one Freedom Rider. In the yes, we don't. Okay. Oh, we're coming to the close of our webcast. I'm sorry we could do so much more, but think of the words you've heard today: reconciliation, love, brotherhood, sisterhood. I think it's a testament to the extraordinary commitment of not only the people on the stage, but of the entire the entire movement. It's uh, been a tradition at the National Museum of American History in events dealing with civil rights uh, to end the uh, program with a song, often with a freedom song. And so we have uh, Xavier Carnegie, uh, who is going to give us a, a fitting rendition to end our program today. Xavier? Thank you. And please, everyone, if you will, stand with me. Join hands with the person next to you and sing with me right over the right. anthem of the civil rights movement, We Shall Overcome. As long as I'm not mad, I'm gonna switch. We shall overcome. We shall overcome. We shall overcome. We shall overcome someday. We'll walk hand in hand. We'll walk hand in hand. We'll walk hand in hand. We'll walk hand in hand, we'll hand, in hand someday. heart I do believe we shall overcome someday thank you everyone give yourselves a hand Yes, actually we do. We're going to get a few questions from the audience. So we're going to... There is the free. I know, I know. I, okay, I, I, you know. I know. Okay. Yeah, I've got... Okay. Unfortunately, they were giving okay. me signals. I only had a couple seconds. I couldn't put them in because I knew he had to sing. We didn't get to meet on uh, Brent Class, director of the museum. Oh, well, thank you for this. It was great. We'll see you tonight. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, please sit down. For our in-house audience, we're going to have 15 more minutes for you guys to ask questions. The webcast is over, but we still can have a couple more minutes of questions so you guys can ask. To ask questions, so we'll reconvene in just a moment. So, uh, sorry that we weren't able to get it into the webcast, uh, but uh, there were so many important questions and so many important things to say. Um, uh, so we'll, you'll have 15 minutes to ask any question you'd like of the panel. They're going to sit back down in just a moment. Uh, I, one other thing, excuse me, one other thing that we, I didn't have a chance to do during the webcast, but I'd like to do now is to point out that in addition to our panel, I believe we have four other Freedom Riders in the audience. Uh, sometimes I like to say the Freedom Riders are everywhere. <laughs> and uh, uh, they're still out there fighting for social justice. 
Uh, we have uh, Dion Diamond. Is Dion here? The, uh, the Reverend uh, Reginald Green. Here. Uh, uh, Joan Mulholland here with her wonderful shirt on. And I believe Travis Britt is here as well. So these are extraordinary, heroic people. So it's wonderful to have them here today. Uh, so we have, we have a few minutes um, for any of you in the audience to ask our panel anything you would like. Just come to the microphone. I'm available. Don't be, don't be shy. That's the spiritual revolution we need. You must have some questions. Okay, here. Nope, she's just coming down. Oh, down. somebody to the microphone. Okay, here we have nope, here we, our first questioner. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Kenneth Richards, and represent. You may want to speak close, close, come closer to the microphone. My name is Kenneth Richards, and I'm Thank from Toys Academy. My question is. How can teenagers today be taught to use nonviolent techniques like the Freedom Riders to settle disputes among their peers instead of revo resorting to violence? Did you hear that, Reverend Lawson? How, how can teenagers today be taught the principles of nonviolence? Bernard Lawson. Well, the, the, the first, perhaps, point of decision for nonviolent struggle participation is you're making a decision that you want to let your life be a life of love and truth and beauty and wonder and integrity no matter what the circumstances are around you whether you have the best of families or the worst of families, that in your own life, you're going to respond to hostility without hostility. You're going to respond to the best of your ability with wit and courage and wisdom and truth. The personal responsibility for your gift of life is yours, and you have to take that's the major human responsibility in my judgment. And then as you do that, as you practice that and work with that, then share it with your family and with some of your peers, your close friends. Make that a part of your conversation. Make that a part of the way in which you look at your school or your community. Um, and then maybe out of that sort of beginning of, of a community in your life, you can see an issue that the group of you can work on and talk about and investigate and see if you can make a change. So personal responsibility is your responsibility to live a life of integrity regardless of what the country teaches, regardless of what a new idols teaches. Uh, and that's the beginning point. You and creation, you and God, can be a majority on the side of truth and love. And that's an untapped power. Though lots of ordinary people around the world live that in a more extremely significant and wonderful way. So that's, it seems to me, is the beginning point. Uh, next question. Uh, my name is Harold Dawson. From, I'm a junior at Bell Multicultural. Wow. And the, my question is, the group of you supported racial equality of your time. What are your views of the gay civil rights movement of my time? The, the question is uh, that, of course, everyone on the panel here supported racial equality uh, in, the, in the time of the Freedom Rides and during their lives, uh, but what are their views on the gay and lesbian struggle? 
for equal rights and human dignity today? To me, it's very simple. I mean, I, human beings are human beings. Uh, gay and lesbians are human beings and deserve that same love, that same life that all the rest of us deserve. I, I, I don't want to even just get into the gay and lesbian. I've got a granddaughter who's got cerebral palsy and, and is mentally retarded. Mm. She doesn't get an equal life either. You'd be amazed at how mistreated she is. She's going to be 22 years old, in fact, today. And I would love to see more done for the persons with mental illness. I live in Tucson, Arizona. You saw what happened to Gabby Gifford. That man, that young man needed help. And he didn't get it. Living in Tucson, Arizona, we have a very big issue with immigration. Some people call it illegal, but to my knowledge, there is no illegal human being. That's right. That's right. <laughs> there, and and I'm willing to bet that you that are sitting here know somebody who's being bullied. Yeah. And certainly could address that issue. So uh, there are an awful lot of people and an awful lot of issues out there. If we treat each other as human beings, of persons of love, of persons of significance. I mean, I, it was said a long time ago, treat someone else as you'd like to be treated. Still holds true today. Mm. Yeah, racism is still alive and well in the United States. And then I think you have to say that segregation is still alive and well. You have to say that sexism is very much alive and well. And these are connected to each other. You have to say that economic exploitation, the high unemployment levels among black people, among young people, among Indians, uh, uh, among uh, Hispanics and lots of other people, the, the poverty of women and children in the United States is both sexism and economic exploitation that is, um, that is akin to plantation capitalism. So these things are all interconnected. So the task, we didn't finish the task in the 60s by any means. We no. were just getting it started. <laughs> Amen. Just barely getting, getting started. So the need for the continuing spiritual, moral, political, social revolution in the United States is there. And I would say that you young people will be facing that challenge for all the decades of your lives. And I would also say that if we are not able to change the nature of our own government, which is the empire of the world, second to no empire that I know anything about in my own studies and reading, unless we're able to change the empire notion of the power structures, the principalities and powers of economics and business and politics in our nation, that empire is going to increase chaos and disaster in the world. So I think we Americans have a particular challenge, but it's an old challenge because it's the challenge that a Jesus of Nazareth or Mary Magdala of Nazareth, of, uh, uh, of Magdala rather in Galilee in the first century. It's a challenge they had. They were an occupied country with the Roman Empire uh, and, and uh, they had to meet that challenge with a different way of living and thinking and working, and we have that task in the United States. That's still our big task. I think we have time for one more question. Okay. Right. My name is Story Williams, and I'm from Stuart Hobson Middle School. And my question is: After you know, hearing about the Greyhound bus burning down, beating, being beaten savagely, and other physical, mental, or even emotional tragedies that you went through, how were you able to, or what told you to stick to your guns and keep fighting for freedom? Well, the question, I believe, is uh, 
you know, once the bus was bombed in Anniston, such a terrifying experience, whether you were there or not, if you were part of the civil rights movement or the freedom struggle, uh, how did you have the courage or the wisdom to carry on with the struggle? Well, John Lewis and Diane and I and Jim Zwerg came out of a Nashville movement that had a very, very strong nonviolent component strategy and understanding. And when we saw the burning of the bus and then when we re realized that the 13 riders left were so demoralized and injured that they could not go on, our reaction was, well, from a perspective of nonviolent struggle, we must go to Alabama and pick up the ride. So our, our determination was if, we, if, we, if, the, if the ride stopped under that bombing, under those mobs, then we may not be able to have another movement anywhere in the country for another 50 years. So Nashville uh, movement picked it up and uh, proceeded to, to uh, uh, ourselves volunteer to go uh, to, the, to Alabama and, be, and to continue the ride. We, we knew that we could not let a burning bus or the mobs in Montgomery or Birmingham shape America. We knew that we had to somehow do something about it. There are things worth dying for. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we knew that, that we could very well, <laughs> it was said repeatedly that night, yeah. jail, beating, <coughs> or death. That's right. and, and some people made out their wills That's that right. night. I did, I did not make up my, out, out my will in going on then into Montgomery and into Jackson. I did not make out a will, but I knew full well that it could mean death. I think we are going to be able to let the last two questioners, or just one, okay? Johnson. Can you get closer to the mic, please? My name is Nicole Johnson. I attend Cardoza Senior High School. And my question is that since you went through everything that's going on, why didn't you, you had doubts or whatever, why didn't you want to, like, stop? I'm sorry. Could you repeat it? Uh, I'm not With sure everything that's go what y'all went through, and y'all had your doubts about everything that was going on, like why or whatever. I wanted to know, like, why didn't you all stop when you all were vandalized and everything? Why didn't we stop? I think it's somewhat similar to the last question, but uh, I don't know if anyone else would like to jump in here, Diane, or about uh, the, the notion of, uh, of stopping. I, I don't know that that ever entered your mind, did it? You were talked to Siegenthaler. You had to be answered. <laughs> Um, the only person you can really change is yourself. And I think we had changed ourselves into people who could no longer be segregated. Mm -hmm. um, if we stopped, the opposition would have thought that all you have to do to stop a nonviolent campaign is inflict massive violence. And if they got that idea, if that message had been sent, they would have done their best to be as violent as possible. We probably would have gotten many people killed if we tried to continue the movement. So we were determined that we must not let that message be sent, that the movement could be stopped with violence. And that is so important because by Nashville picking up the ride and continuing it, we surprised the governors of, of Alabama, Bull Connors of Alabama. When Diane called the Attorney General of the United States, Robert Kennedy, to say that we were picking up the ride, uh, <laughs> this is described in the book by Arthur Schlesinger. Uh, the, the journey of Robert Kennedy. It's just that, that phone call was recorded. It's an astonishing phone call. I don't know if Diane has even gone back and read that book, but it's there. Mm -hmm. he, when, when Jim Farmer was called, Jim Farmer was surprised. What do you, yep. uh, Fred Shuttlesworth recognized 
Fred Shuttlesworth recognized that it had to be done, but he wasn't prepared to do it himself. Mm -hmm. But he was surprised then when Nashville groups said we have to. So part of the business of nonviolent politics, nonviolent direct action, is to, is to do behavior that is on the noble side of life and that helps to, in many ways, surprise the, the mm -hmm. opponent, surprise the enemy. Uh, and you can do that, and you have, prob you have probably done that many times in your own life already. Thank you. I would just like to uh, close the, this uh, remarkable session with two uh, observations, two things that I was reminded about that I learned again today. First of all, history is not inevitable. It just doesn't happen. We read about it in the book, and we think, of course, these things have to happen because we're reading about them, but history happens because people decide to make changes. And also, ordinary, <coughs> people, ordinary people can do extraordinary things. And I'd like to thank the audience for being here so patiently and listening. And please join me in thanking this wonderful panel who's been here today. Thank you.